A few months ago, I did a video on Karahan Tepe, a remarkable early pre-pottery Neolithic site in Turkey, in which I mentioned that the excavators had found some pottery sherds. These were found in a dark fill within structure AB, that structure with the carved out phallic looking pillars, later covered with more fill and some covering stones. This prompted quite a few comments questioning, how can you have pottery in the pre-pottery Neolithic? Or shouldn't archaeologists rename the pre-pottery Neolithic now that they found pottery in it? In fact, archaeologists have known for several decades that crude examples of pottery do sometimes turn up in levels that date to the so-called pre-pottery Neolithic. In fact, I found some of these myself when I was excavating in pre-pottery Neolithic B levels at the Jordanian site of Ain Gazal in the late 1980s. Small numbers of pottery vessels have also been found at the pre-pottery Neolithic B site of Kafar Chahorish in Israel and at early Neolithic sites as far as western Iran. This early pottery was likely more abundant than our meager finds indicate, as we wouldn't expect unfired and low-fired pottery to survive very well in typical burial conditions, as archaeologist Pamela Vandiver pointed out many years ago. I thought I should do a video that might clear up some of the confusion that claims like this might cause. It's also a good springboard to talking about the origins of pottery in Southwest Asia, one of the early, but by no means the first, adopters of pottery technology. First, let's deal with the naming issue. The period names are historical legacies. What I mean by that is that almost all the terms archaeologists use to label periods and so-called cultures were coined by archaeologists many decades ago, especially in the 1920s to 1950s. Specifically, the terms pre-pottery Neolithic A and pre-pottery Neolithic B were the invention of Dame Kathleen Kenyon, the famous excavator of Jericho, in what is now the territory of the Palestinian Authority. She made up those terms to describe layers at Jericho that she believed to correspond with the first farming societies to occupy the site, layers that differed in their houses and stone tools and in which she found no pottery. The major layers directly above pre-pottery Neolithic B, which we typically shorten to PPNB by the way, she called pottery Neolithic A or PNA. At the time, Nobody had a very good idea of exactly how old these periods were, only that they had to be quite a bit earlier than the early Bronze Age, which was then thought to start around 3000 BC. Here I show rough estimates of these periods' dates. Today's archaeologists use a more complex chronology that subdivides some of these into early, middle, and late portions of the major periods, and some have added a PPNC or terminal PPNB between PPNB and PNA. However, while archaeologists are okay with subdividing or refining these old period concepts, they're not quite ready to throw it out entirely just because small amounts of pottery are known from the supposedly pre-pottery periods. Changing the chronological scheme too often in light of new evidence would just make things too confusing. At the very least, it would make it hard to compare research results of today with research from 15 or 20 years ago. Instead, we treat these periods largely as arbitrary terms of convenience. We all know pretty much what they mean, and we also know that there were cultural differences among regions within the same period, and also changes over time within these periods. It's just a convenient shorthand to use terms like PPNB. And it remains true that PPNB does have some defining characteristics that allow us to recognize it when we see it like the use of what archaeologists call naviform or bidirectional cores to produce blade blanks. So we're not going to change the name pre-pottery Neolithic just because we know that some people, in some places, made crude pottery during that period. Excavations at most PPN sites still produce no pottery, while most sites of the pottery or late Neolithic yield many thousands of sherds, fragments of pots that were much better made than the PPN ones. In fact, even the name Neolithic itself originally had a very different meaning. In the late 19th century, on the basis of European evidence, the archaeologist John Lubbock coined the term Neolithic to describe the period that had ground and polished axes, instead of only flaked ones, but didn't yet have metal tools. Only in the 20th century did Neolithic come to be defined instead by an association with early agriculture. Later still, archaeologists came to realize that in places like Southwest Asia, Neolithic people had not actually transformed to true agriculture after all. We now see the beginnings of agriculture as a long process 
that began in the Neolithic but didn't happen suddenly. It wouldn't make sense to come up with a new naming system every time we learn new things. For the second point, let's look at the pottery itself. It actually fits what you might expect for a research and development stage. I don't really mean that literally, only that people in some places seem to have been experimenting with making pots or just use clay to supplement other materials that they were more accustomed to using for containers, like stone bowls or baskets. It appears that most or all of these early pots were built by sequential slab construction, building up the vessel walls with flat, almost brick-like slabs of clay temper mixture. You might be tempted to think that pottery technology grew out of the technology for making plaster vessels, which also occur in the pre-pottery Neolithic B. However, that doesn't seem to be the case. In fact, research by Bonnie Nilam at the University of Helsinki has shown that plaster vessels and pottery ones were used at the same time and continued to coexist well into the pottery Neolithic. Possibly the more plausible precursors for pottery technology were figurine production and especially architecture and fixed features. People were making figurines and other small objects from clay throughout the PPNB. This would likely have made them quite familiar with clay's properties and the desirability of mixing the clay with tempering agents like chaff or sand to stiffen it. They also would have realized that when figurines got burnt in a fire, they got harder. However, they did not seem to have made the systematic use of firing to improve the robusticity of figurines, and the clay bodies of figurines seem to differ from the clay bodies of early pottery. Many years ago, an archaeologist named Pam Vandiver speculated that early pottery making may have depended instead on people's knowledge of how to build mud buildings. As with early slab-built pots, these buildings used a mixture of clay and vegetal fibers, such as straw, as material, and building up pots with slabs is analogous to building a wall with mud bricks or handfuls of clay straw mixture. I'll put a reference to that paper in the credits at the end. Recent research on the really early pottery that we have from some PPN sites, such as Ganj Dare in Iran and Pankukulutarla in Turkey, seems to bear this out. For the rest of this video, I'll focus on the earliest pottery in Southwest Asia, in what are now Israel, Palestine, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, Turkey, Iraq, and Iran. Early as that is, I have to point out that it's not nearly as early as the earliest pottery in Eastern Asia, some of which appears to be about 16,000 years old. For those of you who are interested in that, I'll add a reference in the uh, bibliography at the end of this video. So, what do we really know about this early pottery? One of the earlier studies of this pre-pottery Neolithic pottery was a study by Rebecca Biton and her colleagues of sherds from the PPNB site of Kafar HaHoresh in northern Israel. The excavators of this site identified 23 sherds that they were confident came from secure PPNB contexts, as distinct from sherds that could come, for example, from um, intrusions in animal burrows and that sort of thing. In fact, most of these sherds came from relatively deep deposits, uh, sometimes sealed by clearly PPNB plaster floors, so that we could be quite confident that they are not contaminants from later periods. And most of them have the same distinctive fabric, which the excavators call KHH wear. They're made principally from marl, available a few kilometers away from the site. They're beige in color, but with a gray core that comes from poor firing and high vegetal content. Petrographic analysis of the sherds has shown that the temper used was herbivore manure, as shown by spherolites that occur in them. Spherolites are small, uh, calcium carbonate concretions that occur in the manure of sheep, goats, and cattle. Some sherds show the elongated voids from the burning out of vegetable matter in the uh, manure, and incomplete combustion of this temper accounts for the gray color of the core. The evidence also suggests that the sherds were fired to a temperature not much above 500 degrees Celsius. There's also increasing amounts of evidence for early pottery in the northern Levant, Anatolia, and as far away as the Zagros Mountains of western Iran. Natalia Petrova and her colleagues have conducted detailed analyses of early pottery, dating earlier than about 8000 BCE, from the site of Ganj Dara in the central Zagros Mountains. They conducted a variety of analyses that included microscopic and macroscopic analysis of tiny tool traces on the surface of the pottery to help reconstruct the chêne opératoire, uh, what archaeologists call the sequence of operations um, that were involved in making the vessels. 
And they've also used low power microscopy of inclusions and spherulite analysis. Remember, spherulites are those small calcium carbonate concretions that, that are found in animal dung. Earlier analyses of pottery from Gange d'Arre had indicated that many of the early vessels were large, thick walled ones, up to a meter high, that were probably used for storage. The clay in those vessels contained limestone inclusions that were probably natural in the clay source. Uh, and the temper added was vegetal, but probably not animal dung, and the vessels were built up by sequential slab construction. Other vessels were much smaller ones in a variety of shapes, such as bowls, saucer-like vessels, and small vases. And these were made from almost pure clay without temper. More recent analyses by Petrova and colleagues included vessel fragments as well as samples of building material. In the pottery, very small plant fragments, the kind you'd expect to find if the plant material had passed through the gastrointestinal tract of an animal, are consistent with the use of dung as temper. Both pottery and architectural samples included some spherulites, also consistent with the use of dung as temper. But there are also larger plant fragments in many of the sherds and architectural elements, probably originating from threshing waste. The vessels were built up with small, mostly horizontally oriented slabs, without molds, much as mud and, and wattle and daub walls were built up. Both vessels and architectural elements were finished with thin layers of clay to smooth their surfaces, and this thin coating often exhibits cracks from shrinking during drying. As in the Kafar Hohorish example, animal dung appears to have been a common tempering material for both pottery and the mud used for construction. This lends support to Van Diver's old speculation that there was a connection between the origins of pottery and mud architecture. Apparently, dung has the advantage of reducing cracking during drying and improving the hardness of the resulting vessels or walls. The earliest clay vessel fragments known from Southwest Asia appear to be from Anatolia, and they date somewhere earlier than 9000 BCE. Uh, one study of this early material, based on analysis of 12 fire sherds from the site of Bonkukuhoyuk, showed that only one sherd showed signs of intentional tempering. The rest appeared to be made from minimally processed clay. The sherds were rims from large, simple bowls and jars. By contrast to all these very early examples of pottery, the vessels of the so-called pottery Neolithic in Southwest Asia come from a wide variety of vessel shapes, they're often very well fired, and they have a broad range of tempering recipes, including widespread use of mineral tempers, such as quartz sand and crushed basalt. And they often have highly expressive surface decoration, whether painted, incised, punctate, or molded in relief. But most importantly, during the pottery Neolithic, pottery technology became widespread in most parts of Southwest Asia and really abundant, eventually becoming the most abundant artifact type that we find when we excavate a Neolithic site. From that point onward, the characteristics of pottery also became one of the most common bases for building relative chronologies and identifying so-called archaeological cultures, such as the Samaran, the Yarmoukian, and Halaf cultures. On the basis of small, fragile sherds, it's sometimes difficult to distinguish between fragments of pottery vessels and fragments of fixed installations, such as silos or ovens, as the only real difference between them could be whether or not they were portable. However, it seems clear that at least some of the sherds found in PPNB sites in the southern Levant came from portable vessels and not just installations. The presence of loop handles at Kafar Hohorish, for example, emphasizes this point. Bitton and colleagues conclude that making and importing crude pottery vessels were likely regular practices at Kafar Hohorish and other PPNB sites in the southern Levant. But such vessels were rare even then, and have become rarer still thanks to their low probability of survival. They suggest associating this early pottery with mortuary practices, but it seems at least as probable that they had a practical purpose, like containing foodstuffs. <laughs>